uh, with all of the mock finals that I've given in all of my classes now, um, here seems to be the trend. I am not ready for this, is the body language I see, because this is not the actual final. So let me just kind of tune out, and I see people, oh yeah, that's right, I was supposed to clip my nails today, you know, and all of that kind of stuff, and, uh, you know, you want to start to get to a point here in, in your career and stuff where, you know, you don't waste any time. You know, the fact that you were going to be here and kind of waiting anyway was a time to just sit there and keep looking at that stuff, seeing as some light went on for you as you grow uh, into, you know, being able to, uh, you know, be successful on this final. Um, so, you know, don't, don't just kind of always wait for me to show you how to do things and stuff. You got to sit there and you got to, you know, take your best shot at trying to answer all these, okay? So if you were having trouble with some of these, I think uh, some of these were a little bit hard, uh, but some of them were pretty easy and uh, should have been uh, pretty straightforward for you to get, okay? Now, if you're looking at this and saying, well, okay, this was the final for spring 2016, so now, you know, you don't need to sit there and uh, call your friend who took the class last semester. Oh, can you give me the copy of the test and all that? Because you got it now, right? Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, let's take a look at this first question, this uh, community enhancers, okay, and uh, they received the following contributions. I keep forgetting to put a battery in my mouse, and this is like ruining my life that that mouse is out of battery because I got to sit here and mess with this thing. But um, they want to figure out what should be reported as pledges receivable net of any required allowance. So what's going on? Well, we have this, what? Pledges receivable for $700,000. And remember, we collect, uh, we report our contributions net of any uncollectible amounts, right? So if that's the case, then we're going to do what? We're going to multiply this by 0 0.95, and that's going to give us, what, this 665000 Okay, so the not-for-profit here in this case would do what? They would debit pledges receivable for how much? 700000 credit contribution for 665 good. And then they would go ahead and credit the allowance. What does that come out to? Uh, 35000 or something like that? Okay, and then what this was really asking you is on the statement of uh, financial position, there's going to be what? There's going to be pledges receivable of $700,000. we are going to show an allowance of what? Huh? $35,000. And the net... Pledges receivable are going to be what? Going to be the 665. Okay. Question? Okay, good. Let's go ahead then and let's take a look at this next one. Really need my mouse. And, um, A non-governmental, not-for-profit organization borrowed 5000 which is used to purchase a truck. So they borrowed $5,000 and they purchased a truck. In which section of the organization's statement of cash flows would the transactions, I mean, the thing that makes this question confusing to me is they should have put an S there, right? Because there's two transactions. There's the borrowing of the money and there's what? the buying of the truck and that's really what they wanted you to tell them okay and so what happens we're going to report the borrowing of the money as cash flow from financing activities and the buying of the truck is outflow from investing activities right okay so that question 
could have been improved with an S in the word transaction. I don't really care for this question. I mean, I think it would have been better just to ask you where should the borrowing show up? Because what I really want you to walk away from with this is when you borrow money or you do what? What really I should have wanted to ask you was if you receive a contribution that is restricted for the purchase of a fixed asset, that shows up where? On the statement of, back, uh, statement of cash flows? Huh? Say it again. Good. It shows up as financing, right? When you get that cash for the restricted for the purchase of equipment, and then when you spend the money, it goes out as what? Investing, right? That's really more what I wanted you to walk away with than this stupid question. Okay. So I don't like that one anymore. Okay. Let's go ahead and let's take a look at. Um, I think sometimes a question gets a gets a special uh, feeling for me because you know, or I get feelings for it. However, I'm supposed to put that because it was a CPA exam question. Okay, and so sometimes I kind of you know fall in love with the question because it's something that uh, was has been on the CPA exam before, but um, that doesn't mean it's a good question. Okay, so um, sometimes the CPA, in fact, a lot of the questions that the CPA, uh, AICPA releases are questions that have problems on them. Everybody missed the question, and so they go ahead and they release the question. Um, but then when I get it, I'm oh boy, CPA exam question. Yeah, we've talked about this in class, but it's not the best question because they left that S off, right? And it gets confusing. So, okay, okay. So anyway, so... I try to put as many CPA exam questions as I can on these tests uh, once the AICPA releases those twice a year. Um, during the fiscal year, Fox, a non-governmental, not-for-profit organization, received unrestricted pledges of 300000 Of that amount, 200000 was designated by donors for use during the current year, and 100000 was designated for next year. 5% of the pledges are expected to be uncollectible. What amount should Fox report as restricted contributions? So our first job is to figure out what's restricted here of the 300000 How about the pledges designated for use during the current year? That's not restricted. I mean, they're allowing us to use it in the current year. There's no purpose. There's no equipment. There's no time restriction because we can use it immediately, right? So that part's unrestricted. How about this 100000 that we have to use in another year, in the next year? That is restricted as to what? Time, isn't it? Okay. So when we go ahead and we uh, take our um, our uh, pledges here, we will go ahead and do what? We will debit pledges receivable for a hundred thousand that's the amounts that uh, we're going to be able to use next year i'm assuming that sometime during the current fiscal year okay we must have gotten that cash of two hundred thousand for the amounts they said that we could spend during this year otherwise they're just toying with us aren't they so if they say we can use it this year then they better give it to us at some point in time this year right okay and so then what then i go ahead and they're telling me that 5% of pledges are expected to be uncollectible. Well, the only mark amount for which I don't actually have the cash in hand is this 100,000 pledge, uh, 100,000 of pledges. I don't have to take an allowance for amounts I've already collected. So if you take that 100,000 times what, 0.95, okay, then I'm going to go ahead. Remember, I record my contributions net, so I have contribution unrestricted that'll get credited for the full 200,000 that I've collected right and then what pledges receivable I mean uh, contributions what temp huh temporarily restricted right are going to be credited for 95,000 and then I've put 5% in the allowance didn't I Okay, so that gets a little bit tricky in that, well, we have some amounts that um, 
are already contemplated as being collected in this problem and then other amounts that they're saying this hundred thousand will be collected you know later it's just a pledge and we report our contributions net of any collect uncollectible amounts, right? So the answer is 95,000. Okay. I don't like that question either. I'm going to stop with the questions that, you know, have some amounts coming in and then they collect some this year. It's a pledge, but then they've collected some this year, and the amounts that they're not going to collect, or the amounts that you have to that, that they that they haven't collected yet, or the amounts that you have to consider the um, the allowance for. It's dumb. Okay, stupid questions. I should just have in there pledge. They pledge this amount, and you know um, this. Uh, amount is uncollectible do you know what to do with the contribution reduce it by the amount they're not going to collect right I will hold you accountable though for knowing that if we have a situation where we've provided a service remember that whole thing with the hospital and we provided a service we don't reduce our revenue by the amount we think we're not going to collect we do what we set up the bad debt expense and we record the revenue gross Okay, that's about as far as I'm going to go on allowance and uncollectibilities. I think I got hopped up on it this uh, poor spring 2016, people. They caught me at a bad moment. Okay. Okay. Let's take a look at this one, and they give us the uh, various information about contributed services, and they want to see if I want to engage recognize though those services as an expense and a contribution on the not-for-profit's statement of activities which is their income statement right now when I look at this I am supposed to record the cost of a service and the expense and the contribution if it meets the criteria which is what it required a specialized skill was otherwise needed by the organization and was measured easily so record the value of services some of the time, right? And then what? Then we also have the situation that um, if we are dealing with a um, service that has created or enhanced a non-financial asset, we would also, like a building, we would also recognize the value of that, right? Okay. So let's see if any of these fall into the categories here for the services or, or meet these criteria for services. Okay. This question is asking about services. So how about the veterinarian? Should we recognize the value of that? We absolutely should because what? Veterinarian is very specialized skill and that comes right out of our little example from Save the Canines, right? Okay. How about board member, a CPA who volunteers to prepare books for audit? going to take that because he's a CPA. That's his specialty, isn't it? In fact, is he's a board member of no, is of no consequence. A registered nurse who serves as a receptionist. No, because what? Even though a nurse is a highly skilled individual, she's not prov he or she is not providing us with that skill, right? Okay, so we're not going to take that. How about a teacher that uh, decides to do dog walking? No, if the teacher was teaching, and I don't even know that teaching the dogs would be good there, because unless it was a dog teacher was teaching the dog tricks, um, then we would recognize it. But they're not doing the expertise area, right? So what did we do? We picked up the um, we picked up the eight and the forty-five hundred. Eight thousand plus what? 4500 okay we would debit what expense and we might do these separately if we want to have line items for each one of these you know um, veterinary expense versus um, you know administrative expenses whatever but we would debit expense 12500 we would credit what contribution good 12500 good and so let's go ahead and come down, see if that's the answer. 12,500? C? Okay. Okay, good. Let's take a look at number five here, see if I can get it up there. Good. Okay, during the current year, the local Humane Society, a non-governmental, not-for-profit organization, received a $100,000 
permanent endowment from Cobb and stipulated the income must be used to care for older horses who can no longer race. The endowment re, uh, reported income of 8000 in the current year. What amount of restricted contribution should we report? Now, as I've mentioned now a couple times, when you get questions like this, I'm telling you guys, the way you answer these is by setting yourself up a little statement of activities. When they start getting in to, you know, this happened, that happened, the other happened, what's the amount that should be restricted, your best bet is to use the mechanism of the statement of activities to help you to answer that question, okay? So we come in and we had a contribution. And when the contribution comes in, it comes in either unrestricted, temporary restricted, or what? Permanently restricted. And we got that first 100,000 permanent endowment. So that means it's what? Huh? Permanent. Okay. Hey, if it's obvious, that's fine. Just shout it out. Okay. So that's what? 100,000 permanently restricted? Okay, good. Then what? Then we had some... Uh, investment income that came in here. Okay, we had some investment income that came in that uh, was for eight thousand dollars. And they told me that what the income must be used to care for these older horses that can't race any long any longer. Okay, so what do you want me to do with that? That's temporary. Good, 8000 Okay, good. What would happen if they spent the 8000 So obviously, what, that's all I got in terms of dollar amounts, so zero is the answer here for unrestricted. What happens if um, I spend that 8000 to help those horses? Huh? Good. Good, John. I'd have a reclass adjustment in which it would do what? Come out of the temporary restricted 8,000 and go into what? Unrestricted for 8,000. Good. And then I would report the expense. Right? Okay, good. So this is for horses that can't race any longer. Did you ever hear the one about the horse that walked into a bar and the bartender said, why the long face? Okay. How come baseball players don't use bats any longer? How come baseball players don't use bats any longer? They're long enough already. Okay. All right. I'm here all week. Okay, let's go ahead and let's take a look at uh, number six here, okay? And this uh, PAN, a non-governmental, not-for-profit organization, provides food and shelter to the homeless. PAN received a $15,000 gift with the stipulation that it would be used to buy beds. If that's the case, that money is what? Temporarily restricted, right? It's a pretty nice thing to buy, right, for a homeless shelter. Okay, number seven. A donor gives $10,000 to a not-for-profit organization with instructions that it must be used to fund organization's research. That is going to be what? Temporary restricted, right? Okay, good. Number eight. Non-governmental, not-for-profit organization. Eh. Number eight. Has these amounts that come in. Is there a question? And they want me to determine here which of these categories these should fall into, right? Unrestricted, temporary restricted, or permanently restricted? I have to add them up appropriately. So uh, if the donor stipulated that we purchase an investment in which only the earnings should be used, is that 
unrestricted, temporary restricted, or permanently restricted? That's a permanent restriction of 100,000, isn't it? Okay, good. Future repairs um, to the organization's building and equipment at the donor's request. There was 250,000 that we have to use for future repairs, et cetera, right? So that's temporary restricted until we use it for the repairs. Okay, good. How about 100,000 general operations to be used at the discretion of the board? Good, that's unrestricted, and I lost my headings now, but we think we had unrestricted somewhere over here. Okay, how about um, specific program services? Is indicated by the donor. That is going to be what? Temporary for 50000 Okay. So uh, is that it for this problem? So I think we had what? I don't want to scroll back up there, guys, because it's giving me a hard time. But I think it was 250 plus 50. So that's 300000 here. I believe the permanent was just that, what, 100000 and the unrestricted we can still see here on the screen was 100,000, right? Okay, so 100,000 unrestricted, temporary restricted, 300,000 permanently restricted, 100,000. Hopefully one of the choices has that uh, set of possibilities there. C? Okay, good. Okay. Question? Okay. Let's go ahead and let's take a look at this one. And um, they received a building with no donor stipulation. So that amount is going to be what? Unrestricted. And they say it was a college, right? What if it was a hospital that got this building with no donor stipulations? Unrestricted. What if it was a voluntary health and welfare organization like United Way? Same thing, okay? So the takeaway here, guys, is don't be daunted by a question that calls out a college or something. You're thinking, uh oh, we only had two slides on colleges. The what? The um, all not for profits pretty much do the same thing, right? Okay? And so there's not a lot of uh, specialization type things that we get into here. Okay, good. Mission Good Works, a religious organization, received property as a gift from a local corporation with the understanding that the building would be used principally for a purpose consistent with the organization's mission. How should Mission Good Works record the gift on its financial statements? And um, we're going to use what? Fair value. And we're going to debit building for whatever that fair value is, and credit what? Credit contribution, because they gave me this building, right? So we take the building at fair value at the time of donation, whatever the value was. If the, um, if the donor had bought the building 30 years ago and they paid 100000 for it and that building's now worth a million, we'll do what? We'll debit building for a million. We'll credit contribution for... One million dollars, right? Okay, and so the building shows up on the statement of financial position, and the contribution shows up where? Statement of activities, right? Okay, now that was the best answer. What I don't like about this question is what? It's a little hard to understand what they're talking about in B. Record the property as an increase in assets and unrestricted net assets at fair value, which I think is contemplating here that they would take that directly to equity, like crediting retained earnings for it, uh, which you wouldn't do. The best answer is what? Show the, the uh, building on the balance sheet. Show what? Show the, um, oh, I see the problem here. No, I see why B is wrong. B is wrong because if I debit building on the balance sheet, right, and if it was an unre if I had an increase in unrestricted net assets, then how would I ever do what? How would I ever get that building off the balance sheet, right? Because I would show it an unrestricted 
net assets, and remember, things only get into the unrestricted column when they're shown as an expense, right? So how do we take building expense? How do you expense a building? Good, through the depreciation. So they would have gone ahead and shown this coming in as what? As a debit to the... Um, to the building credit to the contribution and then as we record the depreciation expense we'd literally have a reclass out of the uh, temporary restricted into the unrestricted and we would show the depreciation expense coming out right and when we debit the depreciation expense we would credit the accumulated depreciation I don't like either of these questions. I don't like this one either then because so, then it begs the question well why are we saying that this is unrestricted up here because if it's unrestricted, that is assuming we are going to expense the entire building, which we are not, right? So both of these are kind of funky questions. Take both of these off. Okay, so the answer here is what? For this one, though? C, okay. All right, number 11, Steve Watson, a local certified public accountant, donates in a, significant, a significant amount of his spare time to Beth's Galleries, a not-for-profit museum. He donates 50 hours of, uh, uh, to audit the books and 80 hours selling products at the museum store. He charges his clients 200 an hour. How should we record that? How about the 80 hour selling stuff? We're not gonna record that. But how about the 50 hours doing CPA work by CPA? Yes, we're gonna pick that up. 50 hours at how much? 200 an hour. It's not too bad, I guess. Which gives us what, $10,000? So how much does this guy make? Let's see, there's what, 20, 80 work hours in a year? If he works eight hours a day, roughly, times 200, so what's he making, about 400,000 a year? Huh? 41,000? No. Huh? How much? Four hundred and sixteen thousand, like that. Four one six zero zero zero. Yeah, okay. That's not too bad. Yeah, this guy's doing okay. Now that's if he what? If he that doesn't talk about any of his expenses or anything, right? But uh, before expenses, that's not bad. Four hundred sixteen thousand. If he works a little harder, he might make you know he might take home three hundred thousand or something like that. What's the key three letters in this whole thing? What's the key phrase in this whole thing? <laughs> Take away certified public accountant. This goes down to $25. We don't want that. Okay. For the same work. Okay, let's take a look here, and again, this is one of those ones where they say um, in, hos uh, in hospital accounting to start you out, and you think, uh-oh, here comes special about hospital accounting, and then they revert themselves back to what? The um, generic issues that we have with not-for-profits, okay? So we say in hospital accounting, restricted funds, both permanent and temporary, are what? Restricted, you think? Okay, and restricted by who? By donors, okay? Only donors can restrict, right? Okay, good. Let's take a look at what, number 13 here? Okay, so for number, or that was 13? Oh, okay, that was 12. Okay, so 13. Okay, good. So we're looking at 13, and 13 a little tricky. Okay, because we have amounts going over two different years, don't we? Okay, and they want to know 
what should be reported as unrestricted contributions in the second year in this uh, scenario, which is 2016, right? So a contribution, and again, guys, when you get questions that start having, you know, amounts dancing around the statement of activities one year versus the other year, you make yourself up a statement of activities for to help follow the funds as they flow through, right? Okay, so we have what? We have 2015 statement of activities, and it looks like they're telling us that in 2015, what happened? Some money came in a uh, contribution and they tell us that the contribution was a hundred thousand dollar certificate of deposit maturing in 2016 and the testators uh, only stipulations were that the certificate be held into maturity and that interest revenue be used to finance salaries for a preschool program. So in 2015 that amount came in, this hundred thousand, is it unrestricted, temporary restricted, or permanently restricted? Temporary. It's temporary restricted, hundred thousand, right? Okay, good. Then they tell me that what? That um, interest revenue for 2016 was 8,000. So uh, they tell me that the certificate of deposit is going to mature in 2016 and I have to hold it to maturity that 100,000 and they don't tell me anything about revenues for 2015 so I guess I'm pretty much done with 2015, right? I'm not going to have to worry about anything else here in 2015. It's not until what the action resumes in 20. 16 statement of activities and let's just put that right here under this line and so I'll just go ahead and put a box here for my statement of activities we have uh, we have what we don't have a contribution but we do have this interest revenue don't we okay and the interest revenue is it unrestricted temporary restricted or permanently restricted it is temporary restricted for $8,000 because it has to be used for the preschool program, right? Okay, and then what? And then they say that they actually used the money for salaries, didn't they? So if I use the money, what am I supposed to do? Good, I'm supposed to reclass. So I'll reclass that out at $8,000. And I'm going to show it coming into the unrestricted. And we know in a minute I'm going to show the expense down here for 8000 Right? Because I spent that money. With me so far? Okay, but the reason I kind of wrote it down there is I've got another reclass I need to consider. And I would show them all together, but I'm going to show them separately so we can follow this, which is what? The security, uh, the certificate of deposit has matured, hasn't it? And our only stipulation on that was that we had to hold it to maturity, right? So we take that 100000 out of the temporary restricted and put it into what? Put it into the unrestricted, don't we? With me so far? That's for that maturity? Hello? Okay. Okay, good. So I come over here then and I continue to read and they say when the certificate was redeemed, the Board of Trustees adopted a formal resolution designating 20000 of the proceeds be used to purchase equipment. So they earmarked part of that 100000 didn't they? Does that restrict the money? Say it again, John. It does not restrict the money because what? Boards don't restrict. Who restricts? Donors, those outside the organization, are the only ones that can restrict. So we may put a footnote, um, you know, saying of our unrestricted monies of 100,000, 20,000 has been designated to the board for some sort of use, but it's still reported in the unrestricted column, isn't it? Right? Okay. So if you follow that whole little scenario, then. And you hopefully are getting a feel, guys, for how following these questions through 
and seeing um, what's going on with the uh, statement of activities is the way to do this but they're asking what should be reported in 2016 as unrestricted contribution the answer is what Z zero there's no contribution at all all we had was what all we had was investment income coming in that was reclassed out because it got used and we had a reclass of the what temporary restricted uh, amount for the CD into unrestricted right so there was no contribution at all in 2016 right hello I never understand what it is and it seems to be right in here guys there's like always like a sidebar conference on everything I say I mean, was there a question that I need to be addressing or on these Just bring them up here because somebody may have the same question okay okay good so then what then I come over and I say using the same facts what should be reported as net assets released from restrictions and it was what it was the 108. It was the principal that got released. It was the 8,000 of investment income that got released, right? Okay. Okay, good. Using the same facts from question 16 here, or whatever it was, question 13, um, unrestricted net assets would have a net increase of what? 100,000. That was for the what? The maturity that got reclassed into the 100,000. You say, well, where's the 8,000? Well, remember, we had what? We had the reclass in, but then the expense reduced it, didn't it? Question? Okay, guys, these three questions to me, I mean, I might leave out the, ah, no, I might go ahead and have the money coming in in 2015. These three questions right here, this is, a, you know, a level of understanding of the statement of activities that I absolutely expect you to walk away with from this class, that you know how to kind of handle something like this. Amounts coming in in one year, being spent in another year, meeting donors' restrictions, etc. okay? So I would star those three questions. Okay, good. Let's go ahead and let's take a look at number 16. And this is, you know, this is your Christmas present, okay? The basis of accounting used by not-for-profit organizations in their external financial reports is what? Accrual basis. You're welcome. Expenses incurred by not-for-profit organizations should be reported as a decrease in unrestricted net assets, right? You're welcome. Okay. Number 18. The Midwest Circulatory Disease Society placed an advertisement in a promo, uh, prominent publication in the region. The advertisement provided information about symptoms of the disease and offered practical advice for controlling their immediate effects. The society account estimates that 75% of the advertising copy was uh, devoted to information while the remainder was an appeal for funds. Now, I don't know why you need a CPA to tell you that. It should be an advertising executive told you that, but whatever, okay? And so what's happening? Can we just treat it all as program or all as fundraising? Remember the doggy grooming? We're supposed to allocate it, right? Okay, and so a reasonable allocation would be to take that 20000 and the only program portion is the part talking about the disease, right? Is 75 percent and so that gives us the 15,000 and that just ties back to that little doggy grooming example we had okay okay good come over number 19 Matt Shaw buys a hundred shares of stock for eight thousand dollars in January the value of the stock fluctuates in a narrow range throughout the year in November when it has a value of 9500 he donates it to a not-for-profit entity on December 31st the stock had a value of 8200 and so we are going to carry that at December 31st as what 8200 whatever its fair value is at December 31st that's what we carry it at we don't bring it in at the donors basis so we can follow this whole thing through when he what gives us the stock we would have debited stock 
investment. How much was it when he gave it to us? 9,500. Good. We would have credited what? Contribution. Good for 9,500. With me so far? And then what? At 1231, why did he even give us this stupid thing? It dropped what? Um, was it 1200 bucks? Huh? 1300 Is it 12 or 13? What's 95 minus 8200? 1300 Huh? 13. So we go ahead and we do what? We would debit loss on investment for what? Uh, now, what did we say? 13? Okay. And we would have credited this stock, right? Stock investment. For 13, right? Where do we report the loss? Huh? We report the loss on the statement of activities, right? On the income statement. So if you think about this, we're treating this thing as though we're a trading security, right? Everything, all investments for not-for-profits get treated as trading securities, don't they? Okay. Okay, good. Come over. Let's take a look at number 20 now. Do you remember the example we had in, uh, in uh, when we were talking about governmental, where we talked about the different activities that governments do? I say uh, things that governments do, their programs or things that governments do, and then we had activity. And I talked about building inspection being carried on by the fire and police department. And now they're finding because of that fire in Oakland that actually they don't do so much building inspection as we thought. Uh, and the problem that they're having is that they only have limited resources. And so when a brand new building opens and everything, they go and do all this building inspection. And it's kind of like a shiny new toy to see if it's all OK. But if you talk about an old warehouse, nobody bothers to go look at it, right? Meanwhile, we see that what? It could actually have a pretty significant impact. Anyway, I thought that was interesting because we always talk about the fire and police department doing building inspection under public safety function. But uh, maybe they're not doing as much as we thought they should. Anyway, completely off tar off subject. Okay, just I had heard that this morning and I thought about our example. Okay, let's take a look at number 20. Revenue from an exchange transaction may be classified as increase in which class of net assets? Revenue is automatically considered what? Unrestricted. Okay. Um, you know, donors can't make slaves out of the not-for-profit, right? They can't say, okay, come over here and uh, wash my car, and here's the money for it, and I want you to use it to help the homeless. You know, no, that's not how it works, okay? So if we provide a service, that money is what? Unrestricted, okay? Okay, good. Come over, and let's take a look at um, United Charities. And um, they are raising pledges of 1200 and then uh, they get cash of 800 in 2015. And then it's not until what? The next year that they collect another 200000 on these total pledges. So they've collected what? By 2016, a million out of the total 1.2 million? Right, and they say United Charities estimates 150,000 of the remaining pledges will never be collected. So they asked me, "What's the increase in my unrestricted net assets in 2015?" Now, what I want to do is the whole journal entry for 2015. And so, when the money comes in in 2015, how much cash did I get? I got 800,000, and the way I worked this problem when I was looking at it, guys, is I always get myself grounded by figuring out the cash first, right? We know we got a debit cash in 2015 because we got the cash in 2015, right? 
Okay. Now there was an additional amount of pledges that they raised of one million two hundred thousand, and so uh, not an additional amount, but total pledges of one million eight hundred thousand, of which eight hundred was thousand was collected. So the remaining was not collected. That remains in a pledges receivable status, doesn't it? A four hundred thousand. So I've accounted for the total one point two million pledges. Okay. Now, if I've collected the cash, I don't have any time constraint on that at all, right? Because I already have the cash. And we say that a cash contribution can be recognized when it's received, right? Okay. I don't have to take any allowance on that amount because what? It's cash. I'm not going to not collect it, right? Okay. So I can go ahead and credit contribution unrestricted. 800,000, right? How about this temporary restricted? I mean, how about this remaining 400,000? <laughs> okay, I kind of gave you the answer. This remaining what? 400,000, right? They tell me what? 150 of the remaining pledges will never be collected. That's meaning the remaining pledges that haven't been collected yet in 2015, right? And so that means that what? I'm not going to collect a hundred and what? Fifty thousand of it? That means that they're estimating that I will collect two hundred and fifty thousand, right? Okay. So I have that contribution good that is temporary restricted for what? Net of the uncollectible amount. 250 and that's temporary restricted because I won't collect it until next year if there is time that's going to pass before I collect it it is automatically considered restricted as to time right and then they told me they weren't going to collect what the 150,000 so I stick that into the allowance don't I have 150,000 does that journal entry balance now okay okay good so the answer for this first one, the unrestricted, is what? Is the 800,000. It's the cash I've collected. No need to reduce that for any of the uncollectible amount, right? Because I've collected it. Okay. Then what? Then we come down and we take a look at this next one. Increase in temporary restricted net assets for 2015. There's that, right? Right? Okay. Then what? Then in 20, what question was it? 23? In 2016, now what happens? They collected 200,000, didn't they? Right? told us up in the problem please don't make me go back up there it says in the problem they collected what 200,000 and since they collected 200,000 then I don't have a time constraint on that anymore right time restriction on that anymore so I would do what reclass it out of temporary restricted and put it into unrestricted because I've collected it right and so the change in temporary restricted net assets in 2016 will be a decrease of 200,000 and the unrestricted will do what Increase 200,000, right? Question? What's your name? Do you have a question? You sure? Okay. Because you were kind of going like this with your hair and like, oh. And I used to do that when I didn't understand things. So that's why I wanted to ask. That's why I wanted to ask you. You sure? Okay. Any question on that one? And that one's a little bit hard. I don't think I'll go to that level on this test. Poor 2016 people. I mean, fall, uh, spring people. Poor little spring chickens. Um, <laughs> I don't think I'll do that uh, uh, to you on this test. This this was a little hard question, right? Right, Lincoln. Okay, let's go ahead. Let's take a look at um, 2015. I mean, uh, 25. <laughs> 
St. Mary's Extended Care, a not-for-profit entity, enjoys the service of a group of high school age people who each agree to work three afternoons a week for three hours each afternoon performing a variety of patient-related services such as writing letters, delivering mail. <laughs> this is just kind of funny. <laughs> they write the letter and then they deliver the mail, right? Okay, it's great. <laughs> if they were getting paid for this, this would be a good way to keep themselves fully employed. Yeah, let me write you a letter so I have mail to deliver next week. Okay, so what happens? Uh, anyway, so they do all this. They push people around in the wheelchairs. And um, when I read this, I, it sounded like a speech that's going to give them a plaque of appreciation. The work provided by these young people enhance the quality of life for the residents, okay? And so what's happening? Are these young people specialized? Nobody coming out of high school specialized, okay, unless they're like one of these, gen you know, kid geniuses that graduate from high school and they're eight or something. And so then what? And so we're not going to recognize the value of this, right? Okay, even though it may be what? Although it may be measured easily, they've given the value, it may be otherwise needed, but what? We're not meeting the requirements for specialized skill. Now, if they said this was that, what was that doctor's name? It was a high school kid doctor or something? Doogie Hauser, you know, and they said, and he performed surgery on them for free or something, then we might start to consider that, right? Okay, but this is, none of this meets the criteria. Okay, okay, good, come over. <sighs> Number 26. When should a not-for-profit recognize pledge revenue that is contingent upon raising matching amounts? So this is a what? This is what we called a, um, a, a conditional promise, right? And with conditional promise, you don't take the revenue until the condition is met, right? So if someone's saying, hey, if you raise 100000 I'll give you another 100000 right? Right? Then what? You don't take that hundred thousand until what? Until you've raised the matching funds, right? Okay, good. Number twenty-seven. United Charities accepted contribution from a donor and agreed to transfer the asset to Aid for Friends, a not-for-profit organization that provides temporary shelter to the homeless. United Charities should debit cash and do what? Credit the liability. This is a no variance power situation, right? United Charities is the recipient. And aid to friends is going to be what? Going to be the beneficiary, right? Right? Okay, so the what? The recipient, when they have been directed to give the money to the beneficiary, will, of course, debit the cash, whatever, but they're going to credit what? Liability. Okay? Now, how about same fact pattern, but now aid to friends? The beneficiary will do what? Good. They will debit receivable for whatever the amount is in credit contribution, right? So we got a credit, did I say debit contribution? Credit contribution. So we got a credit to contribution, right? Right? Okay. Sorry, I'm going snail pace here because if I try to speed it up, then it's going to jump to the next page. Number 29, United Charities accepted a contribution. Um, and it is to be used as they see fit. Okay, aid to friends cannot deck, cannot direct the activities of United Charities, but has received contributions to provide temporary shelter to the homeless from United Charities in the past. Aid to friends should do what? No entry. How about United Charities? 
What should United Charities do in this situation? Debit cash and credit, credit contribution, right? So that's a good little set of questions. I'll look for some that are like that. I like those questions. Those are all kind of covering everything we talked about. I'm going to try and find some more like that. Question? Okay. I guess I can go for it now, right? This is just the last question. Page thir number 30, I mean. Okay. Okay, good. Last year, not-for-profit entity received a contribution of 400000 to use for scholarships. The entity had budgeted these 400,000 scholarships in the current year, but only dispersed 350,000. How much should be recorded as released from restriction? You only release it from restriction when you do what? When you spend the money as the donor specified, right? So only the 350,000 gets released. Okay. Question? Measured easily. Measured easily. And measured easily is probably like the dumbest of the criteria. I mean, I think they're talking about, you know, measured easily if it was some sort of, I don't know, Barishnikov came and danced uh, in a mud pit for us. Okay. Well, it's Barishnikov, and that might be pretty interesting. I don't know. People might be willing to come and check that out, whatever, right? But what is the value of watching Barishnikov dance in a mud pit, right? So if you had something weird like that, then you don't have to record it because it's like, okay, you know. Um, you guys know who Barishnikov is, right? You don't know who Barishnikov is? He's like uh, considered the greatest Russian ballet dancer, the greatest ballet dancer of all time, Russian ballet. You guys don't go to the ballet? Barishnikov, unless I said it wrong. I don't know what his first name is. My knowledge of ballet only goes so far. Uh, <laughs> um, the best ballet, in my opinion, is um, Prokofiev, and again, another Russian, uh, Romeo and Juliet. Romeo and Juliet, Prokofiev, not uh, Tchaikovsky, Prokofiev. Tchaikovsky also did a Romeo and Juliet. Now, he's famous for what? Swan Lake. Okay, Swan Lake is good to go see maybe two, maybe three times. By the third time, it's like, okay, I get it. Romeo and Juliet is off the hook. That one's always good every time you go see it. One time I went, um, I, I bought tickets for the ballet, and they mailed them to my house. And somebody came and took them out of my mailbox. So when I said, well, I never got the tickets. And I realized they took it from the mailbox. So I said, hey, can you print me some new tickets? And they said, sure, no problem, sir. You know, we'll print you some new tickets. And I said, good, because I'm going to show up. And I'd like to see who it was that took the stuff out of my mailbox. <laughs> and they say, sir, we'll deactivate their tickets. And I'm sure they're thinking, here comes the guy from Hayward going to cause trouble at the museum, at the ballet or whatever. Okay. So anyway, um, <laughs> so that's what it stood for, John. Sorry. You see, don't ask me questions. You get me off on a tent. So it's what? It's... Uh, measured easily okay and in in the the way they where that's where i was going with the way they use the measured easily is they start giving you the amounts right trying to bait you in to think well it's measured easily or you need to know that if they give you the amounts that means that it's measured easily because remember when we had the veterinarian amount we didn't say hmm what's the value they tell you in the problem right but if it's not a specialized skill like the nurse uh being a receptionist or the board member walking dogs or whatever it was, then we don't take that, okay, even though they give us the amount. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so I highly recommend that your study process be going through the, now there's three practice exams and two mock midterms sitting up there, right? And so you should be very, very comfortable with all the questions for that. If there are uh, things that you don't know about those, we went through, I think, all of those, but that last one that I just put up, and you can go back and watch the video, et cetera, right? 
Um, our final is a week from today, regular class time. So we'll start at 9 o'clock. I'll probably be here between, you know, 7, 7.30, that kind of thing, if you want to uh, come by and uh, confirm your understanding of anything, whatever, ask any questions, all right? Any questions? Okay, guys, have a good uh, weekend. Study hard. Good luck with your other finals, and we'll see you on Friday.